We're joined by Mark Spindler, the father of Notre Dame offensive line commit Rocco Spindler. Mark, how's it going? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing, good. I'm doing great, fellas. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. So the first thing we well, we had to ask, and and just noticing uh, where you're from is, is look, look at, from you got just <laughs> looking at the Wikipedia page, right, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very on brand for for both of us as uh, fans of the office, and we're curious. When people learn that you're from there, how often do they say, oh, do you like The Office? Or immediately just default to that because they know that's what Scranton's from. So well, that's I think er, it, it all depends on what generation. Early on when, when there wasn't The Office and I was from Scranton, people, you know, was synonymous Scranton with Mark Spiller. Now it's Scranton with The Office. So I guess it all depends on which generation that you're talking to. But more often than not, a lot of people, when The Office was kind of crushing it, uh, you know, it, it became pretty synonymous with Scranton, the office, the office, Scranton. And the funny thing is, I, I don't believe the office is in, there's, has not, I don't even think they ever even filmed it in Scranton. Nope. If they you did, said, it was very little. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> you said that when the office was popular, or, I mean, was is past tense, Mark. I mean, this thing is bigger than ever. Um, yeah. I mean, do, do you and your kids watch the office? Well, I, I can tell you, my, my oldest daughter, Gabriella, who, who got me, I, I, that's the, the office is with the dude, Steve Corral, right? Is, is yeah, he still, that's right. That's so right. so I, I wasn't really big into that. But once I found out who he was, now that dude is serious funny, bro. I mean, he is, the whole thing is kind of just, it, it's kind of funny just in a different way. I guess that's what makes it funny, right? I mean, it's realistic in one sense but do I watch it every week no is my daughter Gabrielle I mean she just looks at the guy and laughs and you know, <laughs> I can understand why well Mark we'll, we'll talk actual business with you here uh obviously you were a big time recruit in your own right I believe uh, USA Today All-American in 1986 and um that's when if you were on that USA Today high school All-American list back then I mean it, it's still big now but that was kind of the gold standard for were you a big time recruit? That's way before all the recruiting services and all that good stuff. Um, so Mark, you know, the recruiting process, you went through it, obviously played at Pitt before eight year career in the NFL. How much would you say is the recruiting process changed? Uh, nine years. That's, that's a miscount on my part. How would you say the recruiting process has changed from uh, your time and then going through it with Rocco, your son? Well, really just, I mean, there's a lot of different aspects, but from the technological aspect of it, the touchability, to be able to get in touch with someone, um, you know, why I felt like, you know, and like you did, I mean, if you were on that USA Today team, you were pretty good. What was really appreciative now looking back on it is the hard work and the effort that, you know, the, the coaches as well as the reporters had to go through to just get information that they can use, right? Viable information to take a plane ride or a trip to see someone where the difference is today, obviously you have huddle, uh, you have camps. I mean, everything digitally today um, has changed not only the world, but changed the recruiting process. I would say that is probably the biggest single difference, the ability to be able to communicate with one touch, whether it's a text, email, Twitter, you know, I mean, these kids have all these different, you know, for me back then there was one hard line phone, which you guys, Da 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 da, and and there was a busy signal on the other end. That was the way to get away from coaches. So let's just say when Joe Paterno would call on a telephone and he'd occupy your time for an hour, you didn't really have to deal with any other coach at that time. And so now I've watched Rocco through the recruiting process. He's on a he's on a call with someone, whether it's you know FaceTime or Zoom, and, and there's just constant text messages coming in that you have to wipe away. So you know, to be able to run, you can run, but you can't hide in 2020 when it comes to recruiting. Now, when Joe Paterno is on the phone with you for an hour, do you think that's a calculated move by his part to say, hey, if I'm on the phone with him, no one else can be? No doubt. I think that's, I, I think that was a very smart move by a lot of people. I mean, we couldn't afford the double line back then. And I think at the end, you know, when other coaches started to say, listen, we, we've noticed, you know, the phone between six and 10 at night is busy. I think my dad went out and he invested into the double line where you'd click over and then you'd be on with, you know, either Hayden Fry or Bo or, you know, whoever it was. But, you know, there's just, I mean, just so many differences today. A lot of similarities. Look, you still have to line up. You still have to play. 
right? I, I don't think coaches are going to just go off of what publications and recruiting services have to say because you have to sign on the dotted line for, for that person once you offer them and once they become part of your program. So you have to, you know, for me, it would be, I want to be able to use these as tools, but, but I, I still think there should be some more old school of watching how, how that translates onto the football field with the eyeball test and not through, you know, film. And I don't think that's done often enough. Um, but nonetheless, there's some similarities, but really the digital technological era has changed recruiting, you know, from now in foreseeable future. And of course, in the past, I guess now it's been uh, seven months since you can't even do in-person recruiting anymore. And Rocco was making his decision and having that, you know, affect his timeline for the first five or so months of that. How did that just even more of a reliance on needing to only electronically communicate and uh, finish off the recruitment through that process kind of change things for, for Rocco, but also still kind of maybe not hurt him as much just because he'd been to the, all of the finalists before had been to Notre Dame and Michigan before in person had met the staff had known those guys for, for multiple years. Yeah. We got a little, we got a little lucky as you know, he got into the recruiting game early, obviously, you know, some, some recruits started, they, they get recruited early. Some kids just bust on their senior year for those individuals. I have to think it's just a tremendous challenge, but um, you know, once again, that was a viable tool. Rocco had a plan. Um, unfortunately got disrupted. The plan was very clear. The player was, you know, the plan was concise um, and the plan was very committed. And unfortunately it got interrupted by life, something much more important in the recruiting system in itself. Having that opportunity to be able to be in the recruiting game early, it was advantageous because at the end, when you had a switch to really Zoom calls and, and, and virtual tours of universities, if you didn't have a decent understanding of where you wanted to go, why you were going to go there, what you were looking for. I can see it's a very uh, difficult challenge for those individuals who are being recruited right now in their senior year, because there's some players, let's face it, guys, we know bust onto the scene their senior year and get offered to big time universities that are going to have to make decisions based on what they hear and what they see virtually. You know, that's, that's not the best scenario, but it's better than not having you know, any scenario. Like a good problem to have, right? Yeah. Really once, once you're saying that, Mark, there's two guys I can immediately think of off the top of my head that even Notre Dame's recruiting. Um, here's a simple but very complicated question, Mark, that we could spend a lot of time on. How did Rocco's commitment to Notre Dame, Notre Dame really come together? Um, it was pretty simple. I mean, you know, early in, in, in the process, when you want to try to identify, you know, the, the schools that really you feel are a viable path um, to what you're looking for. You know, first and foremost, that's academically. Tradition, a history of great tradition. And what does tradition mean? It's just not being a Miami Hurricane team of the 80s, 90s. I'm talking about tradition. When you just mention the name, you know, rich in history, right? Head coaches, successes, those type of things. And then having the ability to be able to get this great education and put you in a national football league. There's only so many of those schools that are out there. Notre Dame being one of them and being at the top. You throw in the fact I was recruited by Notre Dame. Um, it kind of didn't work out for me. You know, they were always at the top of the list. My father, obviously, was always a big Notre Dame fan. You know, he, he didn't really go out of his way when I was being recruited to say, this is the school that you should go to. But clearly it was down to Penn State, Notre Dame, and Pitt, right? And he let me make that decision. And he never said until afterwards, once I got into the National Football League several years in, that I made the biggest mistake and how dumb I was. But he used probably much nastier words than that because that's <laughs> who my dad was. And then when he saw that my son had an opportunity, he started to plant that seed early, you know, in his in his mindset. And and, and I did as well. I'm like, this is a this is, you know, I, I didn't do this with my dad, of course, because I grew up, once I became a pit man, I mean, a Notre Dame hater. I mean, I could not stand Notre Dame. I mean, you think about some of the losses in just three-year period of time, two of them against Notre Dame, 
the year they won the national championship. I mean, we beat them from one end of the field to the other end of the field, and there was no way they should have won that football game. And, and really, it was the luck of the Irish was on their side, and that phrase in itself made me begin to, like, hate Notre Dame that, look, you can do everything you have to do to beat them, and sooner or later, like, the Yankees, the ghost will show up and you'll lose that football game. But uh, so the recruiting process with Notre Dame started early, um, especially, you know, when, when you talk about tradition, my dad kind of kind of nurtured it along, wanted to keep it top of the mind. But he, he also, you know, was open to other schools that, that had, you know, great tradition, putting players in the National Football League. But the education part always for all of us, um, really just kept pointing back to Notre Dame. So how did their, or Rocco and his grandfather's relationship really blossom? Like, tell us about their uh, relationship that really, what you said, planted the seed, seemingly a seed that uh, Rocco took to heart from what he uh, said after initially making his commitment so, announcement. You know, we're a big outdoors family. My dad taught us this at an early age, and my father would make the trek from Michigan. Um, I think this would be his 26, 27 year. And unfortunately, you know, obviously he's not going to make that. Last year was the first one they did. And so, but, but you know, I, I got my children involved in the outdoors. And so their grandfather being eight, nine hours away, he always made it a point that when he came here, he wanted to spend as much time with his grandchildren that he could. And, and having my son in deer camp, with him, you know, and shooting his first deer with him and, you know, shaking hands and a cigarette hanging out of the mouth and putting blood on the face and those type of things and having those personal conversations. Obviously, my father was such a big uh, part of my life growing up, at, athletically speaking, and he, you know, always would ask, how's Rocco doing? And he always felt like, you know, I was too soft on him wasn't driving him hard enough or fast enough. And I said, dad, look, I'm going to take what you taught me and, uh, and I'm going to tweak it a little bit and do it what, what I think is best. And he would always say, well, son, what I did with you obviously worked. You know, you're one of the best high school football players in America. You know, one of four freshmen ever started University of Pittsburgh and you went on to play nine years and got paid for the 10th years in the NFL. So let's not, you know, shoot down what I did. So he would always want to be involved in, in, in kind of Rocco's development over the telephone. Let me talk to him on the phone. Let, 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 let me have it. And I don't know what they would talk about. But as my dad began to get sick, and obviously you, you, you knew that, you know, time was precious over the last four years. He'd have good days. He'd have bad days. He'd have really good months, bad months. And he had a good year and he had a bad year. And, and so I think, you know, as, as a grandson, you start to recognize this and that bond and that relationship becomes closer as you know he's getting closer to the other end of the spectrum. And so, you know, Rocco wanted to go through a process. And a lot of people here say, you know, I made a promise to my grandfather and today I fulfilled that promise. So when um, I decided for the last time, I said, I better get in the car and I better go see my dad. Things aren't going well. He's in a hospital. I, I just said to my son, I said, hey, you want to go for the ride with me? You know, and I, I did want him to go and I kind of didn't want him to go because you don't want him to see your grandfather in that condition. He's like, no, dad, I want to go. So we spent a week there and we all got to talk about a lot of different things. And then the last day, I, I, you know, you're looking across and you're, you're like, you know, this is probably going to be the last time I'm going to see my father. Right. I mean, it just, I'm hoping for the best, but I just have an inkling that maybe this might, and the next call I get is not going to be a good one. And so I said, you know, dad, I love you. I got to go. And I got up, I go, let's go somewhere. We're going to drive back. And and when I turned back around, he was leaning over the bed and he was whispering into my dad's ear and I could see my dad shaking his head up and down, yes. I don't know what he told him that day. I don't want to know what he told him that day. And I won't even speculate what I told him that day, okay, what he, what he told him. But what I do know is, is that my dad really had this, this, you know, if he could have it one way, go to Notre Dame. Rocco needed to go through the process, a sincere process, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, right? Um, had to go through this and, and, and find out, is Notre Dame the right choice? And I got to tell you, when it came down to it, I didn't think he was going to Notre Dame. I thought he was going to Michigan. His mother thought he was going to Michigan. And, and when he told us, and in the manner in which he told us, he, I, I, you know, 
and this is this you guys are going to get this first so finally this was about a week before and i said son listen let me tell you i'm coming home from the cabin today and, and you better let me know where you're going to school because we're about a week away here um and i think me and your mother deserve to know this and so he's like all right so i got home that day and, and we ate and I was just sitting there, you know, I had, I was just waiting for the moment. I'm like, don't do it right now. Kind of, kind of gracefully go into it, but that's not who I am. So I'm like, all right, son. So where's it going to be? Where are you going? And as he got ready to talk, I said, son, listen, I don't care where you go. You can't make a bad choice. You cannot make a bad choice. And I really sincerely meant this. And he goes, well, dad, mom, I'm going to go to Michigan. That's what he said. And, and I said, hey, congratulations, son. I'm happy for you. You couldn't make a bad choice. It's going to be 45 minutes up the road. He goes, what do you think about that? And I said, son, you know, I said, you really want to know what I think about it? I said, uh, I said, I think it's a great choice. I said, but as I, I go, there's something stuck in my craw about Notre Dame. It might have just been a better opportunity for you. And I no sooner had that out of my mouth, his mother said, I agree a hundred percent. I think maybe, you know, you sold yourself short. I think this, and I, we, me and her never really talked about this, but something was stuck in my craw about Notre Dame. And he goes, good bitches. Cause I'm going to Notre Dame. Honest to God. <laughs> and, and so we were like, wow, you really, you really, but he wanted to see how we felt. That's how much it felt to him. But I, I don't want to discredit Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. Their recruiting coordinator did a great job. Ohio State did a pretty good job, and Penn State did a fantastic job. My son, he handled this very professionally. Um, he went through an entire process, a sincere process. And I can tell you, if a couple of things might have been a little bit different, maybe he's not going to Notre Dame. But everything fell the way that he needed to fall. It was his decision, and we couldn't be happier to be talking about the Irish. I think I have like 15,000 follow-up questions. Mark, you told me that story on the phone. Maybe I want to say it was like two or three days after Rocco committed. And I was like, we've got to get this story out there for everyone to hear. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yep. Um, as as far, the people what they want. Absolutely. As far as the timeline goes, so he announced the August 8th. Um, he, I believe he did the Zoom call with Notre Dame to tell them two weeks before. So when would that have the conversation where he told you where he was going, where would that have fallen with that? Timeline? I think he might've told me about 10 days before we told Notre Dame, maybe a week before. Okay. You know, he told them a week before, um, you know, shortly after he told us, he called, he, you know, I, I knew for a couple of days. And, and, and so um, I, I think somehow I had a, a conversation with coach Quinn on the phone or something like that. I, I don't even know. I had a question I had to ask him and I already knew that he was probably going there. And, you know, the kind of guy that I am, I, I kind of got to keep it a little thick sometimes. And so, you know, I'm like, I'm like, coach, you know, it's, you know, getting down to the final few schools. And he's like, you mean there's more than two? I go, oh, yeah, there's definitely more than two. Coach, where you been? And, and then he had this silence, you know, on the other end. And I'm like, you know, you know, so you better make sure, you know, you, you, you push right through the finish line and see where it's at. And I'm sitting there, you know, cause I, now I'm setting, I'm setting up the crescendo for the end, right? I want the big finish. I always want the big finish at the end. And so, you know, he made the zoom call and he already knew how he wanted to go into it. And, you know, he's like, you want to thank you for the opportunity. And really it, it kind of didn't sound that was going to go their way. And then at the end, he's like, you know, and so if you have like a number 50, I'm coming to school there. They were, they were all very excited. So we were all excited. We we're very excited. This is a really, you know, how could you not be excited for an opportunity to come to a school with such great history, such great tradition, you know, such great ethic. I mean, everything when you talk about them, when you understand it is, is really, it is a special place with hallowed grounds. All right, one more follow-up question, Mark. So you mentioned you thought he was going to Notre – or I'm sorry, you thought he was going to Michigan. Um, why did you kind of think that at – like what was the timeline of when you maybe started to think he was leaning back Notre Dame? Or was it that conversation between um, him and your wife is when like you thought he was Michigan and then, and then obviously at the end of that 
conversation we thought he was back in Notre Dame. We, we, you know, I, I, I'll be, guys, listen, I, I could, I could swing a jury pool. They ever put me on one, don't hold it against me, but I, I can swing a jury pool, no problem. And I didn't want to be that guy, especially with this decision, because I didn't want it to come back on me. But I'm going to tell you, Jim Harbaugh, who I have tremendous, tremendous respect for, okay? Matt Dudek, who is their coordinator, tremendous respect for. They did a very sincere, fantastic job, and they wanted Rocco every bit as much as Notre Dame and maybe even more so. And and they had to have him. And they did such a good job of communicating on a daily and weekly basis um, and kept it fresh and kept it sincere. You know, it's 45 minutes away. I, I just felt like, you know, that's where he was going to end up. The only thing that, that always stuck in the back of my mind was Rocco wanted to play with an offensive line that he considered a brotherhood. And I'm telling you, early in the recruiting process, you know, I think Coach Quinn or someone got to him and talked about this brotherhood. And so as, as Rocco's conversations kind of s- always seemed to gear towards Michigan, there'd be, a, there'd be, there, he would make, he would make this comment about brotherhood. And I was like, and I was, mother wasn't picking up on that, but I was, and I'm going, it's a little mixed message here. They don't talk about the brotherhood up there. I didn't see former players reaching out to him. I, I didn't get that same feel from the current offensive line, you know, a, as you did with the Notre Dame offensive line. And, and so Everything kind of geared towards Michigan because they did such a great job. But the only thing that was stuck in the back of my mind here was that brotherhood thing. And at the end, I think it was the brotherhood thing that really separated the two programs. So you talk about being 45 minutes up the road. You're in Wolverine country, to say the least. How much does he or you guys get razzled for uh, for going out of uh, what I'm sure is a popular choice for folks at his school? I mean – his team wears a, a helmet that looks like Michigan, right? So what's yes. what have the first couple of months been been like when now that things have been settled? This is what everybody needs to understand about Rocco. He is he is no doubt a very good football player, but he is even a way better young man. And he does things the right way, the sincere way. He's a good, good kid. I mean, he really is, you know, and um, understanding why Rocco came back okay, to, to Michigan and Clarkston to play his senior year. He was offered to go to IMG his junior year. We turned that down. And then when Michigan, you know, kind of started to shut the high school season down, we, you know, apply, you know, I started to fill out the app. Those type of things to go back to IMG. And they're like, we will. And then, you know, Rocco had this sincere conversation with his coach, said, I'm going to roll the dice. These are the reasons why I want to come back. I want to come back, you know, for, for my team. I want to come back for, for everybody that supported me. I want to come back for the town of Clarkston. I want to come back for Michigan in itself, to play in Michigan. And I think people who know him and understand this, they, they might for one moment in time put away their, their selfishness in, in, in their loyalty to the university to understand, you know, a, a really great young man chose a great – great university regardless of how you may feel personally about them as it pertains to the athletic portion of it so we haven't had much backlash at all so I want to end with uh with one more question going back to your playing days here Mark and either for for folks who were old enough to have watched uh, you guys play or to appreciate this or for Mike and myself who were too young for him tell us about playing with Barry Sanders Unfreaking believable. Let me tell you, I was so into the game, right? I, I played the game like a, like a man possessed, right? I mean, I had bad intentions on every single play, but we would we would come off the field and just watch Barry Sanders, right? Because the show he was going to be able to put on was almost a was like a therapy from what you were you were going through on the defensive side. He was incredible, amazing to see him on television was probably something special. To see him, you know, in person was something even more special. But to be on the sideline and be his teammate and understand how balanced he was and grounded he was, you know, from a, from a personality standpoint, 
is is unbelievable. It's something you'll never forget, etched in your memory forever. Some of those runs and moves, I mean, just, I mean, just incredible. He's a great, he's a great guy too. I mean, he's not. Trust me, the, I, I don't have, in a certain way, the appreciation for the modern day superstar as I did, you know, as a Barry Sanders. He was just a throwback acted like guys he wouldn't do good in today's standard right I mean people it's about a show Barry's like look I'm just gonna act like I've been there a thousand times before and I'm coming back a thousand did it almost feel counterproductive to to tackle him in in a sense just because of how incredible he was to watch or you, you every tackle came with a you know, the everything in the back of your mind of, oh, what if he goes down awkwardly or whatever? Yeah, he never took a big hit, guys. That, that's, that, that's one thing. If you watch Barry, I mean, he was so elusive and so explosive. The reason why he was able to do the things he was able to do was he wasn't hit that often. Very rare. I mean, you want to talk about a moving target, folks? Let me tell you something. He was a moving target. He was fantastic. Well, Mark, we really appreciate you uh, joining us here and, and giving us a lot of neat and, and unheard insight into to Rockers recruitment that I'm sure uh, I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, hopefully being able to do this, you know, with you guys as often as you need something pretty good. Look at, I like don't, it. don't say that. We'll have you on. As, <laughs> we'll have you on as a co-host if you say that, Mark. I, I, we'll put I, you I, in I, the I, intro I, bump for this thing. I won't have a problem, but I look at. I did radio and television for seven years, guys, and sometimes. You know, I, I'm really critical, and I, I say what I see. And uh, sometimes some people aren't big enough to be able to handle that. So be careful what you watch for. Ask for you just might get it. Well, we'll have you on in like three years, and maybe Notre Dame will lose a game, and and Rocco missed a big block. So we'll we'll have you on there yeah, to criticize your boy. They lose one game in three years, folks. We'll all be happy campers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right, go Irish. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Take Thank care. You. Mike, how much fun was that with, with Mark? I mean, all, all the, the stories, one, about uh, Rocco's process and, and how he delivered the news. But, yeah, I, I would think there's few things that would be more just a pure football experience and playing with Barry Sanders. Yeah, Patrick, we've been texting about getting Mark Spindler on the show for weeks. And I was like, dude, you, you're going to love it. And uh, I think about 20% of the entire – interview there me and you were just cracking up laughing so that was awesome oh yeah hopefully certainly not the last time we'll uh we'll bring mark back on here